Adam, do you want to walk through the where you are in this, please? Huh. So yeah, th thanks very much for um, for the folks that stayed behind to get some of the stuff sorted. What we did is, well, I guess the purpose was to try to bring some clarity first to ourselves so that we can bring clarity to constituents about what the objectives are, particularly about what the objectives are uh, in relation to those five overarching objectives that we've seen on the slide, because that's where everyone kept going back to. So the first thing we did is we changed the name from overarching objective to goal, because we were getting confused over objective and overarching objective. So on the left-hand side, the leftmost column is the goal. We then have the objectives and the specific components of each objective, um, and then a space to, to add some changes. So what we did is we went through the nine uh, interim objectives plus a couple of extras that we, we discussed, and then tried to couch them in each one of the goals. So for the first one, the first objective, we had defined it as, uh, as the limit, the, the first line. Um, one of the first points is, just for our own clarity, we tried to define what limit was. So you see there, a level of biomass below which no fishing can occur. That obviously needs some work, but it was just something to, to start with. So that's a task for this group, is to better define that limit. I know Bruce had mentioned there's, there's uh, some specific differences between the first two points uh, as to what they are with the limit. Regardless, that's where we are. There's a limit, and below this point, you don't want to fish or have very minimal fishing effort. We said this objective is related to biological sustainability. And then we broke out its components to make it a, a measurable objective that tells us when we want to be there and how badly we want to be there. The second, uh, I guess the, the second major block of rows is a goal that's also related to biological sustainability. It's talking about defining the threshold, and that's we defined it as the, the point three of spawning stock biomass, or uh, uh, unfished biomass, sorry, and the probabilities, and that's nothing new, I don't think. The next section was to, uh, the objective that defines the target, and this is where, in ideal world, where we want the biomass to be, and we want it to be there because that's the point at which the fisheries are not constrained by any conservation concerns. We felt that objectives four, five, seven, and eight all in some way defined the target, and that the target relates back to the goals of fishery sustainability and stability, assurance of access, and to serve consumer needs. The next uh, objective is talking about harvest efficiency, and this is one that we had just made up on the fly, so obviously we'll need some discussion from this group, but we talked about um, limiting wastage in the, in the long line fishery, in the directed fishery, with some probability over some period of time. It relates to the goals of fishery sustainability, and it also lists minimized bycatch, but I guess it's not, that, that should have been removed, because we were just talking about the directed fishery. We didn't talk about um, bycatch, in, for example, in the trawl fleets. The next objective is limiting catch variability, this is on the back side, and that's related to objective number six, which talks about how much the TAC uh, ideally would change from year to year. This was related to the goals of fishery sustainability and stability, assurance of access, and also serving consumer needs. Um, and then the last is a related to an objective that both Paul and I had mentioned earlier, and it's around uh, um, risk tolerance. So if the estimated biomass is close to the limit and things look bad, we should take a more conservative um, catch limit as opposed to being near the limit and things look good, you can maybe take a, a less conservative approach. Again, this is just one that we had discussed on the fly and it's up for discussion at this group. Anyway, so in summary, there's the, there is all the objectives here that we've discussed, one through nine, uh, one through eight, plus two others that we've added, and you'll know that objective nine is missing. Again, we talked about that perhaps being better suited as a, a management procedure. We related those objectives to the overarching objectives, which we've defined as goals. And you'll see that the missing 
uh, goal is bycatch. I don't remember what the actual terminology was in the slide, but that's one that we realized that we have a goal of bycatch reduction, but we don't have a specific objective related to it. Perhaps we can reach that goal by using different management procedures, but that's for discussion. Yes, questions please. Uh, thanks, Adam. I just dawned on me looking on the top of the second page the um, objective pertaining to limiting catch variability number six. You actually define the harvest control rule by setting that objective, especially with the probability of, of one. one. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that's fine if if that is the objective, but in order to achieve that objective, you have to recognize that the fishing mortality rate. Uh, that we use would have to be adjusted in order to accommodate that objective. So that's in conflict with maximizing the yield yeah. in each area too. So yeah, we, we and that's what's sorry. good about defining these things. We uh, we talked about that as well too because we realized uh, well for example number four objective four um, maintain direct fishing opportunity through our discussions people came up to the realization that Chris Four mentioned yesterday that if you had a TAC of one pound you're still meeting that objective. So what we decided for, for our discussions over lunch is we weren't going to um, really change these objectives. We were just trying to couch them in goals. So we realized that for example the number six defines the harvest control especially if it's a probability of one. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a high bar to set. Yeah, each year. But, but, but at the same time, it's um, assuring to know if, if the commission adopted such a policy, then, then going into the annual meetings every year, you know the quota can only change by 15%, no more. That would basically have a constant catch. Just go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was one of the goals of, you know, maybe 15% is not the right rule, you know, the right level, but the idea was that when, someone, when the market, as far as processors and suppliers and fishermen, has some expectation, is the quota going to get cut 50% or is it going to increase by 50%, which is really disruptive at all levels, uh, except for the fishermen, I guess, except for their price is going to go way down. So, you know, so that's exactly what it is. When you come into the meeting, you can anticipate that the stop is going to be at 15% if it's really bad or really good. So our discussions after uh, categorizing all these objectives into the goals, uh, we finished a bit early and we actually realized, okay, for example, we've defined the harvest control rule more or less with this one objective. So maybe we should start talking about management procedures of which one our harvest control rule is part of. So we had, we'd had a, a, a some discussions around different size limits and things like that, and we got to bycatch and talks got derailed, derailed. So we we didn't bring any of that forward. So I, if I could just a second, I in the uh, in looking at the table, um, and as I say again, thanks to the to the group for putting this there. I would suggest me in the and then under the first one under the objectives, we might kind of want to draw a dotted line between one and two there because we talked about. Um, Number one being the sort of ESA type limit that you don't want your fish to end up in court, whereas number two is something where we're talking about um, changing uh, the harvest the harvest rate and so forth. And it, it gets into this level of biomass of which no fishing should occur. We should be clear on that when we're talking about the sort of ESA limit. That's actually no removals. Uh, when we're talking about the minimum spawning biomass thing, we're talking about no directed removals, or we may be talking about no directed removals. So we should be clear about what we're saying in those. I had a bunch of hands up here, so go ahead. What, what do you have? Scott? Scott, Scott. <coughs> you, took the, you took the words right out of my mouth, only you enhanced them. Um, and, and for number two, uh, when you reach the limit, you can you can uh, basically set the catch limit at zero, but would there still be a subsistence fishery? That's that's an open question. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, a question on the um, on the bycatch mortality, and so the explanation there. My understanding is that you saw the current objective number nine reduce bycatch mortality to within five percent, minimize bycatch to the extent practicable as being um, more of a management tool versus an objective? Yeah, that it's, it's a management procedure that we would it's, it's somehow affect harvest rates, harvest limits to, to it, say that's what it is. I think that the question is nobody, I don't want to speak for the group, but I'm not opposed to an objective around bycatch. That objective needs some, some work. And so I guess as I read number nine, there's, there's two different things that are combined there, right? There's reduced bycatch mortality, and then there's a specific limit of 5%. But then the second half of it is minimized bycatch to the extent practicable. So you could have a, a goal or objective that's perhaps, um, you know, uh, that focuses on utilization of catch, right? So you want to maximize utilization of the catch and then so kind of separate from maybe it's not as negatively worded as reducing bycatch as promoting utilization. And I, I think there's an objective that started to go in that direction but we didn't flesh it out too much and that's around the harvest efficiency. It specifically said wastage but I mean I let me let Dan speak to it. Yeah, we didn't we didn't get into too much detail on on how you would define you know fisheries efficiency or harvest efficiency. But I think um, I, I agree with your the approach you're you're proposing. Um, I thought just as a starting point to specifically identify wastage in the longline fishery since it's a, a fairly large component of removals relative to every every other things that we can have some control over. Um, so that's why we started with that one, but certainly it could be expanded. Just, uh, thanks for that clarification. I think um, in terms of whether that should be an objective or not, um, certainly the commission has expressed an objective to minimizing bycatch. It's also composed in Magnuson-Stevens as an idea to minimize bycatch. So I don't think that should be dismissed as an objective for this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I can follow up. So, as you pointed out, Michelle, in the the list of nine objectives, there was the specific amount of the five percent of the annual catch, and then there's to the extent practicable. And so, certainly, I think e either one uh, begs the question: What's the management procedure that the commission would use to achieve that? I think that's where we run into that um, headwall. But, but I, I'm certainly not opposed to putting in the minimize to the extent practical. If, if, if I can, for example, um, as a discussion we had the other day, you know, setting up a joint protocol committee uh, with the council uh, is something that can be considered as a, as a management procedure to try and deal with those sorts of things. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just not understanding the last... Um, very last row under, under the measurable objectives. Um, so you've got two less than signs, and a th I guess the threshold is the point three of of the B zero. And and what's the limit? Is that the other mark? That's the point two. Oh, and we want the okay. So we want the estimate of the biomass to be between those two, depending on estimated stock status, between 0 0.05 and 0 0.5. I just don't understand where that came from. It's very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it, what it's saying is that when you're between the limit and the threshold, depending on where you are, your tolerance for the probability of decline changes. So if you're really close to the limit and it looks like things are getting worse, you should take a more conservative harvest. Um, if you're really close to the limit and things are looking good, you could take a less conservative harvest. If you're really close to the threshold, 
and things are looking bad, you take a more conservative harvest. So it's sort, of, it's sort of an attitude change depending on how close to either of those lines you are. I, I mean, this is speaking for the entire annual meeting, but it's more or less what we do anyways. If Yeah, yeah the, the recommendation is here, but survey trends are up, so we can take a bit more. Or here we're here and survey trends are down, so we should take a bit less. So it's a way of quantifying it. This, okay. is, this is actually based on the objective that the sable fish fishery uses. And the reason that, that I uh, brought it forward and that Paul had spoken to is it's an important component of the sustainable fisheries framework. Uh, just it's a way of quantifying our tolerance for, for uncertainty. Okay, that, that, yeah, that's good. Peggy, then Scott. Well, this is, full, this is embarrassing because I didn't ask this question when we were at the workshop, but um, why wouldn't that just be a management procedure? It could be as part of your harvest control. And that's what Steve had mentioned uh, yesterday. If you had a variable F harvest control rule, like, I mean, like we do now at 20, it could account for part of it. It's, it's an intriguing idea. I just wonder what you'd do if you had contradictory information. You had an increase in your stock CPUE, but fish, fishery CPUE was down or, or you know, sometimes happens. That's the, the big question that I'll leave to Ian and Steve is how do you define probability of decline? Well, you know, if, if you wanted to look at this in, a, in an MSE framework, you try to make, make something that's robust to that kind of uncertainty. So that's, you develop the procedure that, that's robust to that. Well, I hate to use the A word, but um, this last one, I, I was listening to this discussion and you know, your risk assessment by area could be quite different because if you look at what we just did, area two risk assessment might be much less than, as your, your impression of what the risk is in, in going above or below would be less, much less than it might be in, say, 3B. Just a comment. Well, just a comment, too, regarding that. Just regarding that sort of attitude change, I mean, you could define it too. I mean, you, what you're saying is that 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 slope between what the Canadians call USR and LRP w would not be a straight line, but that it would fall more dramatically, and then and then come come to a, an asymptote if it, as as you approach point two. You know, it would you could define it that way. So by, prob by probability of decline, you're talking about maybe other, other um, monitors, other... Yeah, it could be a projection. It could be a projection. So the, the, the assessment model projects that there's an increasing trend in biomass over the next 10 years. Yeah, other indices might make you more confident or less confident, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know how the projection would be done. John, did you have a... And Michelle? Hmm. I'm sorry, I should have added, um, I appreciate the, uh, the table. This, this actually, and I, 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 I need to spend some time with it, but I think this is a lot easier for me anyway to grasp than the list of nine with the red writing in it. And, uh, and it's actually, obviously it's more, uh, more direct, more, more complex than the uh, overarching ob objectives list. So I, I appreciate uh, this. this uh, I, I think I can almost begin to make some sense of this. <laughs> we should. Oh. <laughs>
Michelle? I think I will. <laughs> so uh, just to follow up to, to Gary's question then on the last one, I guess I viewed that as kind of like the 4010 harvest policy that's applied in Hake, for example, so where you do have a, a steeper ramp. So when you're, rather than bringing the stock down to zero, you have a steeper slope so that you never reach zero and you actually stop at 10 and thereby you're able to to recover and get above the threshold that much quicker. I'm not familiar enough with the Hake um, harvest controller to speak to it, but I, I think the 3020, the, these limit references are analogous to the Hake 4010. Um, the, the last objective was more talking about once you know you're between the limit and the threshold, what your tolerance is for probabilities of future decline. But maybe taking a step back, what I should have said, and something that the group discussed a fair bit, was uh, the intent of all of, of our discussions was not necessarily to define the objectives anymore. It was to couch the objectives and the goals so that we could kind of see the train of thought. So we set some overarching goals. We've defined some objectives and their components. Those different components and even the objectives themselves need to be um, need to be reviewed, and that's the iterative process of the MSE. That we have somewhere for the commission to start now, and they can say after they come back to us in, in a year or six months, we can't meet any of your objectives. Start over. Pick 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 80 percent instead of 75, or or you can't have 99 percent. Pick something lower. It's just somewhere to start. And, or maybe Steve will say, I have no idea what this last objective is saying. Explain yeah. it to me or get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll show you what, what Rob and Sean have pulled together because it, it's basically from them. I'd appreciate yeah. that. Thanks. Bruce. Well, first off, I, I would like to compliment the group as a whole that the same questions that you're asking were the same things we were trying to resolve <laughs> during lunchtime in 45 minutes. And, and uh, so, so, I mean, I truly mean that. That was uh, because those are the, some of the same concerns where I think now we have a format that's workable and it has John's endorsement, so I'm proud to, to say. <laughs> and it's a work, it is, to use Bruce's analogy, it's still a work in process, but I think we now have a structure. Where, and we're pretty close to, I think, zeroing in on this. Some things are going to change as we get more information and, and maybe some additional thought processes there, but I think the, at least the functional format is going to get us to where we where we wanted to be for this meeting. So, but I am gratified that your same concerns as a group at large are the same as the mini group we had. Um, thanks, Bruce. I think you're right in terms of the broad strokes on this, and I, I'm from the staff's perspective. I don't want to put words in Steve's mouth, but I, I'm sort of happy with this overall thing. I think we got one more step to do we should be looking at today and that's procedures. Um, if we can look at some candidate procedures here, that would help us a lot if you guys had thoughts on what what are the procedures we might uh, be looking at here to try and achieve these objectives. If Adam wants to read them out, I'll write them on the board. Okay. Uh, one other point about the objectives before I move on is something that I've mentioned that the group had discussed is we came to the realization that some of these objectives just in their current form aren't going to work. For example, number four, like maintain directed fishing opportunity 95% of the time each year. A 1% TAC will meet that. That's not the intent of it. And so we didn't, we, we discussed amongst ourselves maybe which ones to get rid of or, or put aside, but we didn't put forward anything. I, I don't know when that would happen, if that would be through some simulate after some simulations have happened. I think it would be, Adam, and this is what, uh, when I was talking earlier this morning about some of these objectives may survive, but they're going to have different components of them, you know, different probabilities, different timelines, and that kind of thing, but it doesn't mean the overall objective is, is flawed in some way. Just uh, one follow-up on that, but also the little group during lunchtime, uh, at least I felt strongly, we didn't have the license to make major changes to what you what this whole body had been on there. Not that we necessarily agreed with what was there or disagreed, but we tried not to change the content of it because I think that's the group as a whole that's, that has that uh, authority to do that instead of us. So I think Adam mentioned that it's uh, um, whether we personally agreed or disagreed, it's not workable. That will come out and hopefully we'll flesh it out as a body of the whole now. 
what we're looking at here then is um, you obviously did have some discussion about procedures and that would be really helpful to us if we could outline some of the procedures that are highest in people's minds that might be investigated. Okay, I'll say some things, but there was no consensus at the group and some, some of them are a bit controversial. So there, nobody's held to anything <laughs> that's being said here. Uh, so the first manager procedure um, we talked about was accounting by area for fishing mortality with an area. This is not new and we know it'll be a bit of time away before something like this is put in place, but we're talk, talk, yeah, so talking about all mortality that occurs within an area is accounted for within that area. So that would include sublegal fish? Yeah. Can, can you expand? I'm sorry. I, I'm interested in what, you know. Um, well, a, pr a procedure, it, it could be part of the termination of the catch limit. So the catch limit is set each year and then the mortality amount is deducted off it. Right now we just take, um, we, we don't take all of mortality off within an area. It could be all of it. Um, maybe it would help to define a management procedure before we start because we've always, in my work, we've always talked about management procedures as being the combination of the collection of data, the application of an assessment model and the application of a harvest control rule, so it's all wrapped up. So I, I guess we're not looking for defining an entire stream of processes, but maybe some features of management procedures, maybe. So the, the assessment model and the structure of the assessment model could be a manager procedure, at least in my, in my experience with it. So. Like I said, no, nobody's name was associated with, with these. Um, the other... Sorry, I'm, we, I, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm struggling with this one. Maybe, Ian, you could clarify my thinking. Are you saying what you want to do is, is basically change the assessment model structure so that there's a full accounting of legals and sublegals by regulatory area rather than doing the current practice of subtracting off the U26 from recruitment? Thank you. I'd, I'd like to clarify that. Actually, it's, it's not anything to do with the assessment model. Um, what we're talking about here is the process of applying the current harvest policy. So the assessment model generates an estimate which already includes all sources of mortality of all sizes. Um, what we're talking about is after the apportionment step, then I think, if I understand what you guys are suggesting, including in the explicit setting of catch limits, an area by area accounting of all sources of mortality, not just the O26 mortality that's currently included. Yeah, I, th I think so. <laughs> I'm trying to think about the way you said it. I think that's, that's that it wouldn't directly be part of the assessment model. Although I don't know if the assessment model would need to change because your account, like would that result in double counting U26 fish? No. So the, the, the order of operations here is that we, we have estimates of mortality mm -hmm. and those go into the stock assessment and that generates an estimate of the coastwide um, exploitable biomass mm -hmm. and spawning biomass, et cetera we use the estimates of the distribution of survey catch rates to apportion the exploitable biomass. So we now have an estimate of biomass within each of the regulatory areas. That's assessment and then apportionment. And then we apply the harvest policy. And the harvest policy then is what you do about all the various sources of mortality, how you do the math once you have an estimate of how the biomass is distributed. So I believe that it would be, it would, that what you're talking about would be the accounting in the actual application of the harvest policy. The apportionment only apportions the... Sorry, the apportionment only apportions the over 32 biomass, is that correct? So you'd have to, yeah, yeah, e-bio, e sorry. So, so there would need to be some differences there in that accounting scheme as well, I assume, in the apportionment step? Okay, we got a couple other comments in here, Bruce and Michelle. Well, I would kind of like to make a suggestion that, Bruce, you asked for management procedures. Adam's response was, we have a list that kind of came out of this. Maybe we should 
get the list on the board and they'll be uh, uh, an, an easier nut to crack to start <laughs> this thing with. Because if we do this individually, we're going to be here till tomorrow. So do you think, Adam, you can, we can go through that? We just list them if that's okay with the group. Uh, yeah, that's And that's then we can pick reason. through them and see which ones yeah. maybe are easy to resolve yeah. and then because we're going to run out of time if we don't do this. That's fair. So we, um, we looked at, we talked about looking at different size limits. So either having no size limit, reducing the size limit, maybe a U26 or 26 inches instead of 32, and different slot, or somewhere in between, yeah. Uh, we just say minimum size limit. And then slot limits. <laughs> uh, no, it'll be all right. So we, we talked about, um, although very briefly, uh, different harvest strategies. So if we used a variable F harvest strategy, the control points could be different than the limit and the threshold. Um, also, yeah, it could be harvest strategy. Say variable HR, so you're talking about Variable over time or space? Uh, uh, stock status dependent. It's like 30-20 rule, but instead of using 30 and 20, it could be some other threshold. Um, also, what the reference removal rate is. So is, is, is the 20% still the, the harvest rate we want to look at? Or 16? Um, but this is also could be coast-wide and by area. So yeah, Peggy, maybe you could say variable, um, but also uh, the reference removal rate. No, 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 that, that's right. Keep that, and then the next bullet would be reference removal rate. Reference removal. The reference removal rate. <laughs> all, all of this could be by area or close by. And then. Uh, the last two, which are where we got derailed, we're talking about um, national shares and bycatch mitigation. So both of these would be ways in which um, catch limits by areas are, are determined separately from what the, the harvest control rule says. So for example, you take the available biomass in an area and multiply it by, the, by F, that would be the catch limit. That's what we see in the decision tables. But something that, for example, exists in the Hake fishery is Canada gets a certain percentage of the coastwide TAC and the U.S. gets a percentage. National shares, yeah. And so uh, as, a, as a management procedure, this could be evaluated to see what the consequences are. Can we meet our conservation objectives? Can we meet any of our objectives by having uh, these sorts of management procedures? Now there was, and I'll, I'll let the, the rest of the group speak to it, there was a fair bit of discussion around bycatch mitigation and what that actually means, whether that's the appropriate term. So maybe I'll let the rest of the group speak to it. Okay, thanks. I think it's useful to get this up here. Um, well, first I'll invite any comments from the rest of the group and then I want to go to Steve and get his views on um, the applicability and the doability of some of these things. Any comments from the rest of the drafting team on that? I think that's absolutely correct. It's what the whole staff is struggling with right now about dealing with migration issue. If only the fish would sit still, life would be nice. Comments <laughs> from the drafting team? Robin. 
Um, I just have a question. Um, Steve, when uh, Katerina first uh, talked about coming down to the IPHC, she talked about uh, looking at exactly the question of the performance of national shares versus um, an apportionment-like approach for setting catch. And I just wondered whether that was still something that might happen in the next few years or whether you have any thoughts on how that might happen. Yeah, the working proposal and the reason we're collaborating together is we have two very contrasting fisheries that have some very uh, similar interests. The Hake fishery has a national share allocation uh, amongst the two countries in their treaty. Um, and then we use an apportionment method and we uh, wanted to develop a, a similar tool and that's why we were working together so we could examine those questions of how well would a, a, an apportionment method perform in the Hague fishery versus the national shares and same same sort of thing. So that's part of her thesis research and I think she'll be getting along those lines. She's not here. Unfortunately, she said a C++ course um, this afternoon, but that's essentially what we hope to publish. So I'm going to ask Steve to uh, maybe just run over these in your mind and, and give us your views on um, being able to apply these as as management procedures um, and if if they're all going to work and how you might approach that. Sure. Um, first a comment. What I see here are, are one, two, three, four, five broad general categories and each one of those categories themselves uh, could be composed into a single management procedure using metrics from all five of those things. So our harvest policy would consist of how we apply fishing mortality rates in an area plus the size limit plus whether or not we use the 30-20 harvest control rule. As Robin mentioned before, when we think of, of a management procedure, it encompasses the entire process and that's what we're trying to, to simulate in a model. So these things sort of uh, break down nicely. So I kind of, after letting you write them down, um, like the way it's sort of structured because you can take all the combinations of these things and assemble them together and then you'll be quite surprised how, how many management procedures come out of this quite quickly. Um, and that's not a problem. The first one I, I was still a bit uh, fuzzy on in terms of accounting for fishing mortality and, and how we would um, implement that. I think I'm starting to understand what you're getting at, but I would work more with Ian and I think it's certainly feasible uh, to do that. But of course, it has the word area in it. Uh, John confused me when he said I hate to use the A word. I'm not sure what he meant by A word. But now I know. Um, the size limit stuff uh, at the coastwide level, again, is a pretty straightforward exercise. We've already developed the infrastructure to do that, as you've seen in, in our demonstrations here yesterday and today. Uh, so I have no problems implementing those. The harvest strategy on the harvest control rules, we already touched on, on the shapes of those things in the previous uh, MSAB meeting here, so we have a, a pretty good idea of how those uh, would be implemented. The, um, the only thing that's going to be challenging is, uh, again, if you go to a reference removal rate, is that coast-wide or is that area-by-area uh, area basis? And the way we do it right now is we do have a sort of reference removal rate for the coast-wide, but we can only calculate it after the biomass has been apportioned. So um, again, it depends on when you get down to number five there, if you're doing national shares, the apportionment calculation goes away, it becomes an allocation uh, issue, and then you can do the math on an area-by-area area basis. So I think that one's certainly um, easy, not easy to implement, but it can be implemented in time when we develop a more spatially resolved model. Regarding, um, I'm going to skip bycatch mitigation for a second because uh, I think this is I'll come back to it in a second. The national shares one. Um, I guess the first question I have for this group is, is do we have two countries or three? <clears throat> so it really is. Uh, you got Canada's or British Columbia right in the middle of this thing. So it really is a three area uh, issue that we have to deal with and, and how we 
want to do this. The spatial resolution that we're going to be hoping to achieve in the next few years is um, at the, the regulatory area, big number, not the letter level. So we're talking about a four area model of area two, area three, and area four, and area four B. So area two encompasses um, three countries. And I don't know how we would uh, break that particular problem out if we're going to start dealing with migration uh, between Southeast Alaska, BC, Oregon, Washington. Uh, I think that's going to be a, a pretty tough um, thing to struggle with. We can certainly think about it, but I would put it on a lower priority list. If it's two countries where Oregon and Washington become subsumed by um, BC, then uh, we can do it that way too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would. Alaska versus Cascadia. Um, <laughs> Michelle, is this, I'll let you ask this question to some of these ones before I move to bycatch mitigation. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so just to follow up on the previous conversation, I guess on the accounting for the fishing mortality, and in response to your comments, Ian, I guess what would be helpful for me is, is to have a better understanding of the, the apples to apples part of it. So, you know, what comes out of, out of the assessment versus then what goes into the, the e-bio and what's in the exploitable biomass so that what we're subtracting from exploitable biomass is in the same metric as what the exploitable biomass is in. So if we're subtracting everything, you know, including U26 is U26 in the exploitable biomass. So I'm trying to just make sure we have an apples to apples. You want to comment, Ian? <laughs> sure, I, I think that's actually a pretty important topic. Um, the, the concept of exploitable biomass is really just a construct of the harvest policy. So it's defined by a selectivity curve that was developed when the harvest policy was developed. And its only real meaning is that it's the selectivity curve for which the rates that we're currently applying were found to be appropriate. It, we can't really change one without the other. If you change the rates, as you point out, you've got to be comparing apples to apples. So that we, we know that the original harvest policy was developed and the rates we're applying were consistent with the definition of exploitable biomass. Um, it is not, as Steve pointed out, it is not as simple as just all the biomass above 32 inches or all the biomass above 26 inches. Um, what the appropriate biomass would be to include all sizes of mortality would really require all development of a whole new harvest policy. And as Robin pointed out, unlike something that approximates biomass representing exploitable fish that we see in the, in the set line survey, which is what we currently do apportionment on, we don't have um, any kind of a, an index on a coast-wide level of what the relative abundance of small fish is. And so we, we wouldn't have, there is no, there currently is no analog for apportionment for all the biomass that's out there. Um, so this is really development of a completely new harvest policy from scratch, uh, which there isn't much of an analog um, for. There are some ways, and, and, and we're, we're preparing a report for the North Pacific Council in June and for the commissioners in September looking at some of these aspects of managing and accounting for total mortality. Um, and there are some analogs and some things that we can look at that are consistent with the current harvest policy, but in terms of subtracting off, you know, what, what would you use as the numerator and the, and the denominator in this equation by area by area? That, that's not clear at present, I don't think. Thanks, Ian. That's, that's very important. And when Ian <coughs> excuse me, did draw the distinction between accounting for and managing total mortality, and we, we need to look at that 
from the broader perspective is what's in the mandate of the Halibut Commission regulatory process and what's in other regulatory processes. So this becomes a, a much more complex issue in a real hurry when you talk about trying to manage total mortality. Accounting for total mortality is something that's, that's front and center in some of our thinking right now, but the, uh, the second part of it's uh, perhaps um, in another world right now. <laughs> Yeah, regarding uh, size limits and harvest strategy, I, I would hope that uh, any movement to lower the size limit would not put additional pressure on the stock. So I, I wouldn't want to see a lowered size limit uh, increasing the e-bio, which is what it would do. So, I mean, you'd be including more fish in the e-bio then. So I would want to see, you know, any size limit change or any size limit reduction accompanied by a, a change in uh, harvest rate such that the pressure of the stock remains the same. So I, I don't know how you connect those two, but yeah, I wouldn't want to see the just uh, the e-bio go up as a result of lowering size limit. Thanks, Gary. That's a really good point, and it's actually the point I'm making next week at the, the Wakefield Symposium on bycatch. Um, when you, if you certainly reduce the size limit, you're also going to certainly reduce the FMSY. Uh, you may actually catch more fish, but they're going to be more smaller fish. Um, but you, you will have to adjust the rate downwards to compensate for the, the change in selectivity or the apparent selectivity in the retention portion of the fishery. So that's um, any change in the harvest policy would, would first and foremost have to address, or sorry, any change in the size of the would first and foremost have to address the harvest rate that we apply to those fisheries. That's, that's quite correct. And then if you recall from a couple of years ago when we looked at size size limit changes in the in the raw raw that was that was front and center on that is that the harvest rate would have to go along with that there was one one wrinkle to that which was um, changing the high changing the size limit but not changing the catch limit at the time to see exactly how the the industry responded so we could take a look at what the selectivity curve would look like under a change size limit because that's one of the significant factors in changing the size limit is what does the actual retention selectivity look like in the industry. If it actually behaves accord, completely according to the, the procedure, then you get one result. But if there's other things like high grading or avoidance of, of things so that the actual size selectivity doesn't match the size selectivity of the population, then you get a different result. And it's important to have both those things in the scenario when you're going to be looking at it. So if you look at the raw raw documents, and we can put them up on the MSA website. Uh, if you look at the raw rod documents on this, there were several different assumptions made about the selectivity curve, and you can see very different results as a result of those selectivity assumptions. Well, and one other factor, which I, I think would be an unknown at this point in time, from a fisherman's perspective, if you reduce the size limit, but the processor sector says, okay, now we don't have 10 20s anymore, we got 6 to 20s, and they're okay with the same price on that, then you're probably not going to have much high grading or selectivity by the fishermen. But if we break into another subcategory of 7 to, I don't know, 12 or something like that, and then, then you're probably going to have an incentive for people maybe high grading there. And I don't know, John, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, if the market would have any reaction to that, but what do you do with this? Well, we got 9-pound fish now coming in under the, tent, under the current policy. <laughs> Oh, you were looking for an answer. <laughs> well, I think I think uh, I think the PAG's made comments on this. Uh, I think there's probably some diversity of opinion. For sure, there is. But um, clearly, if we started harvesting six-pound fish, uh, I think you see a difference. I mean, I, my guess is you'd see a difference in price. You see a lower price, and then you'd probably the next thought process is you probably have some high grading going on. We do harvest now, I don't know what the percentage is, but in 3A, uh, we don't call them 1020s anymore, we call them under 20s. Because the market's very clear to us that um, if you're calling them 1020s, you have fish that are well under 10 pounds. So I think the industry has gone to uh, 
um, under 20s. I think some buyers are even calling them under 15s and 15 20s. But there'd be, you start harvesting six pound fish, there's going to be a, well, I think you'll see a drop in price. Gary? Yeah, as a fisherman, we, we don't want to address any six or seven pound <laughs> fish, but I, I know in BC there is, the odd fish comes in under 10 pounds because there's a, a small amount that's under the line, um, up to an inch or so, I think, More in, in the case of some boats. But um, regarding high grading, there's no high grading in BC because we're all being watched, and uh, so that just doesn't happen. But I, I would hope that um, maybe we can think about adding an economic objective uh, that would be in conjunction with the size limit decrease, such that you know, we want to um, make the uh, fishery more efficient, but but we don't want to go down that slippery slope where we're taking a great reduction in price either. I guess, Gary, I'd just say too, in 2C, where I think we have a fairly similar size breakdown, we're not seeing, I don't think we see any high grading either. I think when you get to 3A or 3B, 3B especially, where a lot of that fish is completely under, um, and, and if you went to a six, if you went to a six pounder, you'd you'd see some. I I don't know. Depends on what the price difference is, obviously, but I think you'd see some some sorting. You know, we we have, there has been uh, I think over the recent couple of month, years actually the the whole thing about changing the side limit um, and part of the argument which I'm not clear about it says well so much of the fish are under 32 I mean is that the assumption that they're not growing that fast they're never going to get over 32 they're going to be a 20 year old fish that stays under 30 32 inches uh, so I guess man that's an Ian question on what what we're seeing in the stocks is I'm really reluctant to use something other than that 32 because we have a historical norm, there's a market that's established for it, and I know that 32 inch fish coming across the scales, there's some of them coming in less than that 10 pound range, and that's starting to be some issue, and that, as John mentioned, uh, the processes that I deliver do typically, they, they towed them by 10 to 15, or under 15 and 15 to 20, and they charge your customers more if they want that bigger end of them. So, I mean, I don't, I don't quite understand the logic of because the fish are smaller, we need to reduce the limit. I mean, is there some biological reason that that's good for the resource? Um, well, I mean, that's something we could, we could and should explore. It's good, there's going to be an interaction between the yield per recruit and the size at which most of the fish are being caught. Um, I, we, we haven't actually done those. I, I haven't. Maybe Steve's done some of those calculations. Um, I. The, the trade-off, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's complex because we've got different weighted age in different regulatory areas, obviously. Um, and the, the trade-off is going to be between the amount of fish, that the, the size of fish and the total quantity of fish that you get to retain, as well as the fish that, are, that die as a function of being captured and released. So that's going to be yield that you're, you're giving up. So you're going to, ideally, you harvest the fish at the peak of their yield per recruit, which means their, their bodies are growing bigger, faster than they're dying off when they're young. And at some point you turn the corner and they're now dying off faster than they're adding somatic growth. And that, that's what's called maximizing yield per recruit. And ideally your fishery targets the fish right there. But if you're selecting a lot of fish prior to that, which you then discard, some of which die, it may actually be preferable to retain some of those fish rather than just have that mortality occurring, but th this. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. I just want one follow up on that because at the North Pacific Council meeting, there was a whole thing that was done there, and they did that about changing the size. And uh, the result of that is that if we went to a smaller size limit, the long-term effect of that is we are actually giving up yield. Now, I believe that was the North Pacific Council work, not ca not the Commission's work, but it was that. Uh, when that discussion came up, a change of the side limit of fish, that so you give up yield by catching these smaller fish. Does that that's, anybody that's, help me out with that? We probably should go back and look at the uh, the review on the committee. That sounds like a commission analysis to me, and it was probably one of the ones that came in there last year. We should look at it. But we've got Jim and then John. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So, and I think this is where we're 
getting stuck on coastwide, or I think we were coastwide versus sort of, sort of regional aspects. Aspect. So you, the the other thing to look at is is, is a variable size rate where um, you can keep up to or down to whatever limit of 26 or 28. Um, or now it's if it's you know if it's this or above you got to keep it, and and what you know this is goes to behavior. But if you're going to lose, and you've already said what I was going to say, you're gonna, you're losing some of that that biomass because of you know you're going to hooking mortality you know, after you lose it after you release it. If fishermen were given the option of retaining some amount of you know below 32, their option whether they release them or not or keep them. I don't know how you would model that because it, it does go to behavior, but if you make the assumption that maybe 20% of the overall is, especially is going to be kept, um, so you're looking at this variable size limit and at the discretion of the fishermen for, you know, basically going to efficiency of harvest efficiency of, of what makes most sense to them. So if you're in 2B or 3B and you're spending days plowing through you know, just sublegal fish. Is it doesn't make more sense for you to make a trip or two of predominantly 32 to 28, or does it make sense for you? I don't know. I'm not a fisherman, but it seems to me that we have these regional differences where we need to look at sort of some regional, you know, maybe some regional try to try some regional solutions. But as we prefaced, it's we're looking at coast wide. But could you? to say it's 20% and see what happens. I don't know. But it seems to me that that's where we're heading for. That's, and those sorts of things are, you can examine those uh, by looking at selectivity curves that are unique to individual areas. We're not there at that point there, but, but you're right, Jim. Those things are, they're, they're certainly susceptible to analysis. No question. I mean, John? So I'd, I'd want, to, I want to follow up on something you said, Ian, because I think about 10 years ago at the uh, annual meeting, we were shown some graphs, and my takeaway from those um, was that most of the fish we were catching were females uh, with a 32-inch 32, 32 size limit. In fact, the males weren't growing enough to be highly selective to the gear. That is, most of the males were small and were not big enough to react to the, the hooks that were set. Is that is that right? Because one of the reasons to go to, I mean, at least in my mind, one of the reasons to go to a lower size limit um, might be if you could catch males instead of females, then your spawning biomass, which I think is strictly females, uh, relative to what you're taking out of the fishery, would go up, uh, which at least, again, in my mind, <laughs> seems like it'd be a good thing. Um, so my first question is, is that right? Most of the males, most of the fish we catch are females. And second, most of the males are not getting big enough to be caught in the gear. Uh, the first part is definitely right. We see a high percentage female in the landed catch, or in the, in the landings. But I'm not sure, given, given the high proportion of sublegal fish in the total catch, it may not be true to say that most of the fish that are being caught are female. Most of the fish that are being landed are female. You're right, and, and I should have mentioned the sex ratio in the discussion of yield per recruit, because if you are accessing additional yield in the males, uh, I, I was thinking about this more in terms of, of the females, but the males and females will have a different yield per recruit relationship. The males don't grow as fast as the females do, uh, and they also have a appear to have a slightly lower natural mortality rate. So again, this is all stuff that would be rolled up into the yield per recruit. But you're right, there may be some trade-off in that you may be accessing more male biomass. Um, the, the estimate, the, the, when I looked at the numbers, um, it looked like currently a 10-year-old male is about 50% um, selected by the fishery. You, you, can, you can also flip that around and say roughly 50% of the males might be selected by the fishery at age 10. Obviously, there's a very wide range in, in size and age, even within a regulatory area, how that have highly variable growth. So some 10-year-old some fish will have been in the fishery for several years, and some won't make it for several more years. Um, but the, you're right. The sex ratio is, a, is an important consideration in the calculation of yield for a fruit. I think the other, other, other part, and you, Ian touched on that, and, and 
way that looks is the selectivity curve for males is much flatter than it is for females. It goes up in a real hurry for females, and it's quite flat for males. So if I, so if I could just follow up. So if you went from a 32 to a 28, would you venture a guess at what, how the sex ratio of the landings might change? I mean, how many, you didn't say based on landings, what percentage of those are females, but if you had a number there, what do you think would change if you went to a 28? I, I mean, I think this would all be part of a discussion about, uh, where is it, size limits. <laughs> um, this is, I think, all stuff that has to be part of that discussion. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's very relevant, and I, I think that the, the analysis would have to be sex-based. It would have to have growth rates that were different for males and females. Um, I don't have the, the sex ratio numbers off the top of my head because we don't actually get sex ratio information from the catch. The fish are cleaned at, dressed at sea. Um, this is you know, a problem that we are all now aware of. Um, we, do, we do have some estimates that are available from the survey, which is probably a reasonable proxy since we're using similar gear. I, I don't remember those numbers off the top of my head. I think we're on the in the range of 70 to 80 percent female um, in the landings, but don't, don't quote me on that. I, I think it, it's, it would definitely be the case, given the, the difference in, in growth between males and females, that you would see a higher proportion of males in the catch if you went to a lower size limit but I don't know exactly how much percentage change that would be, but you're absolutely right. It would be a relevant factor in the analysis. Uh, just one is, a, one is a comment, one is a question. I'll do the question first. You said 70, 80 percent of female, and I'm assuming that's based on weight, or is it based on numbers? Because, you know, females get bigger, so, so there's proportionately we might take the same number of males, but you're going to have a higher percentage of the weight is going to be out of females. So, I said, don't quote me on that number, Bruce. Oh, well, no, I, is it really, I, I I percent based on poundage, or is it based on numbers? I believe that is based on numbers, but I, again, oh, I don't okay. have those. I, those I, numbers. I believe that is based on numbers too, because that that we're extrapolating that from the survey, which is definitely based on numbers. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, the percentage is not important. It's just you know how is it computed. And uh, second, is as a comment, um, as far as the whole discussion, um, as a fisherman. If there is a significant price break between those littler fish and whatever John and other buyer community people decide, then there probably is going to be an issue about them leaving the water. If the if the price difference is very small or none at all, then if they come over the rail, I'm taking them home. And I think that's probably will be the behavior of I would suspect that would be the behavior of similarly situated longliners. And I, that's something that you can model. You know, you can model it sort of if there's a price differential or if there's not a price differential and what they are, and that's that's one of the things we can look at. And we did, when we looked at this the last time we looked at size limit, we actually went to the processors and, and got some estimates of what they thought they might pay for, a, you know, an, a six or eight pound fish, and we put that into the uh, part of the economic discussion. So that's 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 modelable, if you will, but it, it's going to be, uh, of course, based on the assumptions you make. So, Steve, just. Is, I guess it's a question for an individual fisherman in the room. If I could give you 23% more quota right now, would you put a camera on your boat? Because <laughs> that's roughly how much, with the current size limits, we're throwing overboard and is dying. Is about 23% of the quota. And that's coming out of everybody's pockets. So everybody's paying for that right now with partial observer coverage and the assumptions we make. But if each individual became fully accountable for all of the fish they chose to catch and keep, and if you decide to throw a 26-inch fish overboard, it comes off your quota, or at least the 15% of it that dies comes off your quota, uh, we could, in theory, increase your quota tomorrow. Well, I think the interesting thing as a fisherman is one of the hot topics in Alaska here for the last two years is we're trying to go to cameras on board instead of live observers, and we're having a hell of a time with that. I mean, the, the model right now says you're going to get an observer, and they're, I believe they're placating us with a little bit of, we're testing it thing, but we're getting observers and uh, down to 40 the foot guy, boats. The guy next to you is going to solve that problem. Uh, oh, maybe it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, would you like to comment on that one? Yeah. That's another topic. I'll talk to you on the side. 
So, I think, I think, sorry, go ahead, Dan. Well, we, it, we're doing, there's more than just testing. Um, so there is a, there is uh, an effort to get cameras on boats. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's a totally different uh, problem than in Canada, different um, characteristics. The ports are scattered across a larger geographical area, um, far greater number of boats. Um, the costs are not known for how, how we, we would do this in the U.S. Com compared to Canada. Um, and so we just can't, we can't take a system in Canada, which is what I think a lot of people have been assuming you can do, is take the Canadian system of electronic monitoring and just place it in the U.S. And so um, the agency knows that it, um, it needs to be more uh, aggressive in doing the work, and we have an electronic monitoring work group. We are meeting during the Wakefield Symposium, and, and I, I hope we don't draw too many people away from that. <laughs> um, and I'm sure we probably won't. Um, so it will still take a couple of years to get to a point where we can actually put cameras on boats and use the data for catch accounting. Um, but it, there's more being done than I think the fleet understands. We, we might be a couple of ways away from, a couple of years away from recommending management measures too. So, um, Steve, you want to come back to the last one there that we skipped over, which was bycatch mitigation? Yeah. Um, thanks for reminding me. The next week, you all know there's a, a symposium in, in Alaska or in Anchorage, the Wakefield Symposium. The whole subject issue is bycatch uh, fisheries and bycatch um, is on the agenda. I'm submitting a, a paper on that and as I was doing the research uh, and the modeling efforts for, for this paper, one of the things that became blatantly obvious to me is that any harvest policy we develop here is strictly a function of the bycatch fisheries. Um, when, when you have a, a big bycatch fishery and, and especially when the catch data are subject to, to error and, and perhaps bias with partial observer coverage and stuff like that, our harvest policies are also going to be biased. Uh, so it, at some point it gets a bit depressing. You sit, sit there and think long and hard, well if these are always biased, what are we even doing this work for? Because it's just, it, it, it's always going to be wrong. And then you, you realize that, wait a minute, I'm not dealing with live ammunition, I'm dealing with a problem here and I can actually explore how sensitive uh, these policies are to uncertainty in bycatch and how we should uh, adjust our harvest policies according to how much we think they're, they're biased and uncertain. So when, when I see the words bycatch mitigation up there, um, I know right across the street around the corner there's some big commercial industries that are involved in trawl fisheries for flatfish in the Bering Sea that utilize halibut and I think uh, they're mostly operating under the auspices of the North Pacific Council and it's going to be a very uh, hard uh, or fruitless exercise for us to sit here and, and pretend uh, we can do anything when, or, or model our way through a bunch of bycatch scenarios but then not be in correspondence or direct communication or collaborating with members of the council on how we're going to implement these strategies. So this group almost has to reach out and start to um, engage uh, some of the other trawl industries and, and peacock long line fisheries and, and other groups that utilize bycatch and work on this because like I said, it's great to see the, the ratio, or sorry, the, the total amount of bycatch go from 20 million pounds to less than 10 million pounds here in the last decade. But the scary part is, is that the ratio is increasing. More of this fishery is now utilized for bycatch than it is for the directed fishery. And our assumptions about selectivity imply that not only are you going to take an 80% cut in your quotas, in the future you're going to take even more of a cut and more of those halibut high-valued fish uh, are going to be utilized to catch lower-valued, high-volume fish in, in a much bigger, 
multi-billion dollar trawl industry. So that being said, um, I kind of am scared to touch that one with a 10-foot pole, uh, mostly because my Kevlar hasn't arrived yet in, in dealing with those, those big commercial industries. I'd love to challenge, uh, tackle the challenge on those problems, uh, but those are some big shoes that we're going to need some more help with, with council and, and other industries involved at this table. It's the white elephant in the room. Um, no one really wants to deal with it here. Uh, I will, um, and happy to, to take it on, but I'm going to need a lot of help uh, wading my way through that one. I think it's not so much an issue of, of people not, not wanting to tackle or something. It's, I think there's a clear recognition that this is a multi-agency issue that needs to be dealt with. And, it's, and I, was, I said something earlier, um, sort of half facetiously on this, but, but quite correctly is that one of the management procedures here could be to set up that kind of communication procedure, that kind of, uh, for want of a better term, I think, Jeff, we were talking about it yesterday, and protocol, uh, protocol committee, you know, of, of how to approach this. That, that is um, a management procedure that you can, you can implement, and I, I think that should be on the table here as well. Sorry, I left out one other point. Independent of the North Pacific Council, we can develop harvest policy here if and only if we can get a, sorry to say the word, bycatch allocation agreement such that if our quota goes up 10%, so does their bycatch quota. And if they're, so we stick with a fixed ratio. Uh, the, bad, the bad news is, is if we go to the negotiating table right now, they got a big ratio. Had we gone to the negotiating table back when they were only taking five, fifteen percent of the total catch, uh, you would have had about a much better, much stronger um, leg to stand on. So, again, it's it's a council issue and an IPHC issue and and lots of big trade-offs. I don't think it's necessarily predicated on a fixed ratio on on these things in terms of how we develop harvest policy but it it's, has to account for uh, what that bycatch is. You know. Dan. Thanks. Uh, Bruce, actually when you commented that a management procedure could be um, some kind of cooperative work between the two uh, bodies, uh, I, I wrote that down because I thought that's, that's a reasonable approach. And at our last council meeting in Anchorage in April, I did point out to the council that I thought, and this was under the discussion of our Gulf of Alaska trawl bycatch management plan, which is to establish a catch shares type program for the trawl fleet so that they can manage their bycatch better and we can reduce the bycatch. I did comment that I thought at some point the, this process, the MSAB, would have to intersect with the council's work, both in the Gulf and the Bering Sea. It, was, it wasn't clear to me then uh, how it might um, happen, and, and I, I'm still wrestling with that a bit, but uh, as you, obviously you've heard in my comments and, and questions, but um, I, I think there are a couple different ways to approach it, and um, I'm, I've always been interested in working with the council or with the commission on this and um, recognize that you know, we obviously rely on the commission for the, the bulk of the biological work on the stock, and we have a strong interest in um, maintaining opportunities for the directed harvesters, but recognize, of course, that under our uh, Magnuson-Stevens Act, there are uh, goals for achieving OI for all the fisheries, as, as well as minimizing bycatch and maintaining community opportunities and so on. So it, 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 there are multiple objectives that we have to try to achieve, too. Um, Anyway, long-winded way of saying um, I think there's some starting to see some ways that we can collaborate, and so look forward to more of that. Adam and then Jeff. Uh, first, I think the point Steve made about reaching out to other groups is really important. Um, when when we had talked about bycatch mitigation, that wasn't explicitly part of it, but I think that's probably the most important part of it. Um, when we were talking about my bycatch mitigation. It was in a way that was actually almost analogous to national shares. That it's just you, you have the harvest strategy, you take a certain amount, and then 
we change that amount based on mitigation. So it could be reducing it in some areas to increase in others, reducing the harvest rate in some areas to increase the allocation in another area. Um, and then evaluating what the consequences are of doing that. So, for example, if <clears throat> Area 2 was mitigated for bycatch in the west and Area 2 always took a much larger biomass, eventually there's no fish left in Area 2. And that consequence would be realized through the, the simulations. Or, or it could be that there is, there is no consequence, that there's still enough migration. Who knows? Thanks, Adam. Jeff? Bruce, I don't recall your exact wording uh, for the management procedure for bycatch, but if you could cite that again, I think we should add it to the board up here because I think that's pretty fitting um, for a procedure, uh, management procedure for this issue. Well, I think what I was getting at is that the, and, and this is part of the discussion we had the other day, is that um, setting up, um, for want of a better term, sort of protocol committees to deal with both the councils, the councils um, and potentially other user groups is, is a management procedure that we should be exploring in terms of trying to optimize around uh, both halibut yields and, and northeast Pacific fishery yields. So that, that is something, I don't know to what extent we can simulate that in this process here, but I think as, in terms of a management procedure is something this group should be considering. Okay, I, I just sort of side-checked here with Steve on this about whether or not we have enough information uh, to be moving forward on this in terms of understanding both the objectives and, and some of the candidate management procedures that we should be looking at here. Um, and we're reasonably satisfied that we have sort of uh, sufficient marching orders and understanding of them right now, uh, but I'll invite the rest of the group to comment on the sort of, sort of other considerations that we might still be missing that you'd like to see in here. <laughs> okay, um, let me just uh, talk a little bit about sort of making sure we're on the same page in terms of next steps. Um, the staff will um, start to work on these these issues. We will uh, within hopefully within about a uh, week and a half, two weeks, we'll have out summary minutes for this. The recordings are archived, so we can go back and check on the archive phones. If you know this, we are, it's not our intent to produce detailed minutes. We'll produce summary minutes with the salient points. Uh, this table will be part of that, um, including the management procedures we're going to be looking at over the next little while. Um, we're going to start working like crazy on, on the... Uh, working continued development on the coastwide operating model, giving some of the, trying to fill in some of the boxes that Steve outlined for you the first day in terms of, you know, what we have in the way of available options for that model. Um, we will uh, provide this information to you as, as soon as we can. Um, it'll be out for your review. If, we, if, you've missed, if we've missed anything in the summaries, get back to us right away and we'll, we'll resolve that. This will be up on the MSAV site so you guys can come in and take a look at it. Um, for the um, fall meeting, it's much as I outlined in the slide this morning, um, we would like this group to be able to report to the Commission and I think the consensus on this was that it would be a relatively brief report in terms of what's, what's being looked at and part of this can be this table that we've, you know, with everybody's help, was developed on this today and reporting back to the Commission, but I think the Commission will also perhaps want to have some commentary for us to come back to and say if there are some things that they would like us to be looking at that we may have overlooked in this. Um, when, we, when we, I guess the, the question I have for you is um, when we finish the, the minutes of this meeting, this becomes a public document and we're going all the way up to the Commissioners as well. So there may be some feedback from the Commissioners in the interim here and I will endeavor to get that to you um, as a result of sort of bi-monthly calls that uh, Paul and Jim and I have uh, sort of going over various issues so I can have some preliminary feedback if there is some from the commissioners at that stage. Anything else outstanding in people's minds that uh, we need to do in terms of reporting or others? Paul. Uh, in the uh, summary minutes, uh, Bruce, were you thinking that there would be some uh, comments uh, from the IHPC on uh, the management procedures and um, the objectives. 
I'm not sure I'm following that, Paul, sorry. Well, I heard, heard some feedback from Steve and, uh, and Ian on some technical issues about, you know, and some pros and cons is what I was guess I was hearing, Bruce, and so I think it would be helpful to, to document that. And um, both on the management procedures and also the objectives, I think would be helpful. So if I understand you correctly, you're coming for a little, little bit of staff commentary on, on the nature of these objectives and the procedures that are going to be investigated, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Because, um, you know, when uh, Steve was going through it about some of the uh, concerns, well, not concerns, but some of the challenges would be of dealing with some of them, it was what I was hearing, and so I think it would be okay. useful to see that documented. Okay. Okay, yes, we can do that. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. And I also know that there is... The, so we use some pretty specific terms, limit, threshold, target. It might be helpful to have uh, some of those definitions, at least in terms of how the commission is using them, so that we, um, we know we're all talking about the same thing. The A word. <laughs> <laughs> is that allocation or area or? <laughs> a portion one. The other A word, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the input from everybody was absolutely terrific at this meeting. I thanks especially to the drafting team who put together the, the table and stuff. I think we've made great progress, certainly from the staff's perspective. Um, this gives us our marching orders and what we're going to be spending a lot of time on. I know Steve is sort of sitting here sweating bullets over all sorts of things. Um, I will remind you again that um, we need to be clear when we're talking to um, our extension parties and I, I do want to make sure that you guys are doing as much extension as you possibly can. We're trying to use a different method of communication to some extent in this group and that's to have a more grassroots style of communication where people should feel free to contact members of the MSAB for bringing the ideas forward here. Uh, but also to condition people's expectations about the length of the process and the likelihood of us getting things in terms of recommendations to the commissions. We're not looking at sort of specific management recommendations, certainly within 2014. Okay. I also want to extend my thanks for all your input and feedback. It's very much appreciated. And Adam, can I have a word with you? Okay, thanks very much, and we'll uh, see you in October and get the minutes out to you as soon as we can.